Welcome back, students. As we dive into Chapter 3, we're going to be dealing with quantum theory and electronic structure. These are topics that you've heard about before because you've taken a chemistry class before, but you may not remember much about them, and so we're going to be doing a little bit of a review here at the beginning and then expanding on those topics to cover some new information. This word quantum is an important word in modern physics and chemistry. And while we're not going to go too much into depth into quantum theory, we are going to touch on some of the basics. It's a fascinating field of study. It has led us to a very exciting growth and understanding of the physical world, particularly on the atomic and subatomic level. Before we deal with quantum theory and electronic structure, we need to cover more generally energy. And so we're going to talk about energy and the types of energy. If you've had a physics class before, you may well remember this. There are different types of energy, and we're going to cover those now just as a refresher of previous material. So in these blanks, blank energy is the energy that results from motion. And you may recall that that is kinetic, K-I-N-E-T-I-C. And the specific type of kinetic energy that we are interested in when we are studying chemistry is thermal. Thermal, T-H-E-R-M-A-L, that's related to heat. Thermal energy is the kinetic energy of the random motion of atoms and molecules. When atoms and molecules are moving fast and they're vibrating uh, very quickly, they have thermal energy. In contrast to kinetic energy, which is the energy that results from motion, we have potential energy. P-O-T-E-N-T-I-A-L. Potential energy is the energy possessed by an object just by virtue of its position, by virtue of where it is. Not because it's moving, but because of where it is. And the type of potential energy that we're most interested in in chemistry is called chemical energy. Chemical energy is a potential energy. It is potential energy that is stored within structural units of chemical substances. For example, due to their bonds or due to other attractions. And here's an important phrase that you're going to hear again and again, due to electrostatic attractions. Electrostatic attractions between charged particles. So when you have a positive and a positive sitting right next to each other, they will repel each other because like charges repel. Or if you have a negative and a negative sitting right next to each other, they will repel each other. If you have a positive and a negative sitting next to each other, opposite charges attract, so they are going to have an attraction energy. So even if these charged particles are not moving, there is still a potential energy because of where they are in relationship to each other. Another way that we can think about this is to imagine this pen that I'm holding right now. Now, if we assume for just for a moment that this pen is motionless, and we have to make that assumption because in reality, this pen and my desk and I and you, we are all hurtling through space as the Earth revolves around the sun and as the solar system revolves around the center of the galaxy and as the galaxy is moving through space. But for a moment, let's imagine that this pen is motionless. It nevertheless has some energy just because of its position within a gravitational field. That's called its potential energy. This pen has potential energy by virtue of its position. Now, if I were to let the pen go, it would convert that potential energy into kinetic energy, just like that. So you can see it has potential energy by virtue of its position and kinetic energy by virtue of its motion. Let's sketch out this classification <clears throat> of energy fairly quickly. So we're, we're going to have energy and then the two main types of energy. And so I would like for you to put the two main types as I've 
mention them up here, see if you can determine what the two main types are. And there's going to be a specific type with under each of those classifications that we're going to be dealing with chemistry. So take a moment to see if you can complete that diagram of the classification of energy. Pause the video and do that and resume the video and I'll complete it. Okay, let's go ahead and finish this. In energy, we have two types of energy. We have our kinetic, which is the energy of motion, and we have potential. And the type of kinetic energy that we are most going to focus on in this course for chemistry is thermal. Thermal energy, the energy of the motion of these particles, chemical particles, potential, there we go. And the type of potential energy that we're most going to focus on in this class is chemical energy. When you burn paper or a candle or something like that, you are converting its chemical energy into thermal energy. So you can convert between types of energy. You cannot create or destroy energy according to the laws of thermodynamics, but you can convert between forms of energy. So those are the types of energy that we're going to be talking about. Now what we need is a way to measure energy. And the SI unit of energy is the joule, J-O-U-L-E, joule. So it is abbreviated capital J. So one joule is the amount of energy that results from a two kilogram mass moving one meter per second. Now in the classroom, typically the way that I demonstrate this is I take a two kilogram mass that's about just under five pounds and I put it on the table and then I move it a meter, that's about just over three feet, over the span of one second. And if you take a two kilogram mass and you move it one meter over one second, then that amount of energy that you've just expended is one joule. And of course, we would have to ignore the coefficient of friction in the tabletop. We would have to ignore the fact that I'm also moving my body, that I'm overcoming wind resistance and so forth. But that gives you a general idea of about how much a joule is. It's real world energy. You can actually interact with that much energy and, and notice it. It's not some teeny tiny amount that uh, you can't conceive of. If you've taken a physics course before, then you will remember this equation, E kinetic. So the kinetic energy, the E, capital E is energy. So the kinetic energy equals one half times the mass, that's not meters, but it's mass, times the velocity, that is the speed squared. So if we plug in the values from our little thought demonstration up here and we say one half, the mass is the two kilograms right there, and the velocity is one meter per second and we square it, then we get this amount right here. A joule is one kilogram meter squared. This is in the numerator, kilogram meter squared over second squared. So let me rewrite that. One kilogram meter squared over second squared. That's one joule. Now on the back of your periodic table that we've given you, if you turn it over, you will see that we've given you this value. One joule equals one kilogram meter squared over second squared. Okay? So you have that value. All right, I'd like for you to take a moment and notice the units of length and mass that this joule implies. The units of length imply the meter. And the units of mass imply the kilogram. So you may not recall, but kilogram is actually the base unit of mass in the SI system. So the units of length and mass that the joule has within it are the base units. The meter for length and the kilogram, kilogram, oh for goodness sake, kilo 
gram for the mass, okay? So the length has to be in meters and the mass has to be in kilograms if you're doing joule conversions, all right? We're going to be doing some math with joules here in a little bit and I just want to point that out to you because we have to be in these units in order for our units to cancel.